Uh, my name is Anna Hawkins. I'm from Manly, and I've been in Iowa for six years. I know that you don't have any power over Congress, but there is a crisis going on with our lobbyist system and our corporations kind of scratching Congress's back and, oh, I'm going to, you know, whatever. Um, but what are you able to do or what is within your realm to be able to get more of Congress's, Congress's interests aligned with American interests versus corporations? Brilliant. Thank you for that question. So I'll say a couple of things. First of all, the real people who make the laws are not the people in Congress. They're the people in the three-letter government agencies in Washington, D.C. I mean this literally. Okay, and the, you know, so the media is going to report this afterwards, and that's fine. I mean this quite literally. I believe that most, that is to say over 50% of the federal regulations today that have the force of law are unconstitutional. And we will rescind them on day one because they failed the test of West Virginia versus EPA, probably the most important Supreme Court case of our decade. Last year came out that said that if certain regulations of the EPA applying to the coal industry were unconstitutional, that's what the case said, because Congress never gave the EPA that power. Well, if that actually fails the test of the Constitution then literally most regulations from the FDA to the EPA to the FTC to the SEC to the CDC on down are actually also unconstitutional. That gives me as the president the power on day one to say we're day one rescinding those federal regulations. Take a pen, they're, they're done across the board. And furthermore, that we are reducing the size of the federal employee headcount by over 75%. That's actually a big part of them, how we address corruption in D.C. Because those people are the ones shadow writing the laws, the budgets. And then they hand it over to Congress. These people are just puppets, right? They, just, they don't read it. I'm, I'm not kidding you. I know most of them. They just, they just shepherd it on through. They do what they're told to do, play their part on television. And hope, hope to get a slot on cable news that night. Like, that's really the way it works in Washington, D.C. So once you have actually laid off the 75% of the people in the administrative state, that's really what helps us restore integrity in Congress. I do favor term limits for Congress, three terms for congressmen, two terms for senators. That's easy. That will require a constitutional amendment. So I'm honest with you guys. Constitutional amendment takes a long time to get through. I'm not going to promise you that I will get that done. I can't. Anybody who does it's a false promise because that requires a lot of different thresholds. What I can promise, though, is that there's one executive branch. If I'm your next president, I'm the leader of that executive branch. And the people who report into me, they will be, have the ability to be fired, 75% of them will be. The regulations that they promulgated are unconstitutional. Without asking Congress for permission, I will rescind them. And we'll have actual meritocracy rather than protection rackets for how we run those three-letter agencies, which is where the most of the source of the problem is in the first place. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a dark underbelly to the whole topic that was part of your question, and I want to address it. I'm not a... I'm not a party man, actually. I'm using the Republican Party as a vehicle for advancing an America First agenda. The point I'm about to make was actually a left-wing point in pre-2010. And I don't care. I believe it then. I believe it now. We have a corrosive influence of mega money in politics. It's just a problem with our entire system. I don't think that somebody who has served in the government should be able to lobby the government for 10 years until after they left. I just, I just think there's no reason for it. This should not be a profitable enterprise. You should, public service should be about service and then find honest work back in the private sector. I'm dead set against the use of super PACs. And unfortunately, this is a, even this year for the Republican Party, it's a super PAC primary. In and a bunch of super PAC puppets. I'm a patriot who speaks the truth. If somebody wants to make a deal, if I'm the nominee, as I hope and expect to be, I'll face off with probably not Joe Biden. I don't think they're going to let him run against me, but whichever other puppet they trot along. I will make a deal with them and say, listen up. You disavow super PAC money. You don't show up at their event. Say you don't want it. I'll do the same thing. See, the left used to say that in the pre-2010 era. Corporations aren't people. Well, now they've quietly gone the other way. But I think we have to set a better example. I'll make that deal with everybody in the Republican primary field right now. Disavow super PACs. There's maximums for what you can give to a campaign. 3300 bucks a piece to a campaign. And that's a lot of money for a lot of people, but it's not enough to buy off 
the politician class. Fine, that's the system we've got to have. It's an open offer. If everybody else on that debate stage next time accepts that offer, I will too. But we're going to have to lead by example. Until then, I have to compete, and we're going to do it that way. But there is a corrosive influence and a corrupting influence of money and politics. That's what the ESG movement's about. Anybody here heard of ESG? Does that term mean anything to some of you? So, so that's what you see in corporate America happening today. Right? When these corporations say, oh, you have to adopt these Paris Climate Accords in your corporate boardrooms or these racial diversity quota systems in who you hire into the executive ranks of a company. What are they saying? They're saying, we don't trust the people to do that through the democratic process. No, we, the elites, have to use your money. And here's a dirty little secret. Most of your retirement accounts are being used right now to vote for policies in corporate America's boardrooms from racial equity audits at Apple to scope three emissions caps at Chevron that you didn't know your own retirement accounts are actually being used to vote for. That's the same problem. It's, it's an influence of money on politics because they're saying that, forget the political process, that's not where the laws are being made. They're effectively being made in corporate America's boardrooms, using your money to do it without your knowledge. Now, I'm allergic to politics. I tried to solve that problem and we made some progress through the private sector. The last company that I founded is a company called Strive. I believe in solving problems as an entrepreneur. Strive competes with BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard by offering index funds that say, no, we're not going to vote for those policies. We're just going to vote for products and services for profit as being the focus of companies. And, and that's been a success. And I'm glad I can make a small dent through the private sector that way. But these are symptoms of a deeper cancer in our country. And my reason for doing what I'm doing is not because I relish being the next U.S. president. A board and I were talking about this the other night, right? And I started at not 0%, but 0.0% in March, right? And then we had a gut instinct that we, we weren't going to get in this for the sake of going through the motions. We had a gut instinct that this was, this was our purpose, that we're each put here for a reason. God doesn't you know, tell us what his plan is, but he works through us. I think at this point now, I'm pointing at, you know, second place in many of the national polls. We're very serious. We're getting a head start on picking the people who are going to be part of not just the cabinet, but the people who are going to help us even in the unspoken roles. I do not relish occupying the Oval Office for eight years. It would be, just to be very honest with you, it would probably be nice, you know, right? And that's, like, that's, that's the sound going off in my head. When I hear, when I think about what those years are going to be like in the Oval Office, that's, that's like, the Situation Room is calling, right? So that's what, that's what it feels like to me. And, and you know, I'm not just to be very honest with you guys. I've lived the full American dream. It'd be nice to ride around on Air Force One, sure it is, but it's not that much of an upgrade from what I do for the last couple of years in my life. Okay, this is this is a matter of service of what we're going to do for the next eight years for the country, and I do think we have an opportunity. To do in 2024 what Ronald Reagan did for this country in 1980. This cannot be a 50.1 election. We're skating on thin ice. This cannot be an election where MSNBC and CNN trot out the winner the Monday after the election. No. I don't think we have it in us as a country. I mean, I think that this could be bad if that's where we are. This has to be a moral mandate. A landslide minus some shenanigans is still a landslide, okay? And I think that I'm the only candidate in this race that can deliver that landslide margin. Bringing along, yes, young people into our movement, young and old, black and white, man and woman, doesn't matter. Look at the way we're running this campaign. We're going to the south side of Chicago, to Kensington in the middle of the inner city of Philadelphia. I don't call Zelensky, but I do talk to people in Maui who have been affected by fires that could have been preventable if the government actually did its job instead of standing for indigenous water rights. This is what it means to put America first. It means putting all Americans first. No state left behind. No city left behind. No American left behind. A multi-ethnic, working-class coalition to a landslide victory. That's our opportunity. I'm going to ask for your help in delivering it.